Welcome to Campbell Law. We meet this afternoon in a solemn and serious occasion to honor an iconic justice who single-handedly shaped constitutional law as we know it. We meet also to celebrate the institution of which he was an integral part, which we as lawyers all revere, and we meet to celebrate the majesty of a republic in which the rule of law is ingrained in our very fabric. Nothing was more important to Justice Scalia than his faith, and in his honor, Bishop Michael Burbage has joined us today. After the invocation, uh, the speakers will speak uh, in the order on the program, except that I will return to introduce our last speaker. Uh, Bishop Burbage, we are honored by your presence here today, and I would invite you to the podium for the invocation. Thank you so much, Dean, and thank you to Campbell University. What a great a tribute, a great honor, and most grateful to you for the kind invitation to join you in, in prayer. And so let us pray. O oh God, who arranges all things in such wondrous order, reflected in the right relationships you wish for all people, we give you thanks for the life of your servant, Justice Antonin Scalia, and for the contributions you made possible through him to the rule of law. Not only a distinguished jurist, you made of him a dedicated spouse of over 50 years and devoted father to nine children after your own heart and gave him a vitality, humor, and ability to befriend others well beyond those who agreed with his legal opinion. A man in whom you reflected honor and dedication to public service. Most of all, you gave him an abundance of the gift of faith, guiding him to embrace a relationship with you in Christ, founded on the rule of your law, but also on the necessity of your mercy, to live justly in this world unto the life you will for all people in eternity. Guide our remembrance of your servant, Justice Scalia, this day, and how we may now further discuss and apply what he sought. Authentic justice, born of your truth, founded in our nation, and entrusted to us to administer as your servants, first now and always. We ask this in your holy name, O Lord our God. Amen. Hello, um, I'm Kevin Hales. I'm the president of the Triangle Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society. Um, thank you for having me today. Uh, I've been asked to address the question, what was Justice Scalia's impact on the Federalist Society? Uh, I'll answer it in this way. Uh, without his steadfast campaign on the bench to view the Constitution as a knowable, meaningful, binding document, the Federalist Society may not have been anything other than a, an inconsequential college club with a quirky, archaic view of the Constitution and of the law in general, if it continued to exist at all. In fact, when the founders of the Federalist Society started it in 1981, when they were law students like some of you, uh, it was sort of founded simultaneously at Yale Law School and the University of Chicago Law School uh, in 1981. Uh, Yale professor and later judge Ralph Winter, he was their faculty advisor at Yale, told them that their cause was, quote, hopeless. And without Scalia, he likely would have been right. The whole point of the Federalist Society, or at least a key underlying principle of the Federalist Society, is the restoration of the Constitution. For years, the trend had been toward a so-called living Constitution which is a concept that is always lurking as a way to increase the power of the government, untethered from the rule of law, and which allows judges to 
say they're following the contours or the, the principles of the Constitution while actually making up whatever they want it to say. Law schools, in fact, had been, had been uh, de-emphasizing the teaching of the Constitution in the late 70s and early 80s. The Federalist Society advocated a Constitution constructed of words that mean something. And so did Justice Scalia, of course, to great effect, who was appointed to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals at about the same time the Federalist Society was starting up. So note the timeline. Uh, Scalia, then a professor at University of Chicago, was the first faculty advisor of the first chapter of the Federalist Society at the University of Chicago Law School in 1981. In 1982, he was appointed to the D.C. Circuit, and in 1986, of course, to the Supreme Court, both by President Reagan, of course. His ascendance as a jurist happened at the same time the Federalist Society was becoming influential. These things were not unrelated. Now just an anecdote because it's possible to talk about Justice Scalia without thinking of things he said. In the 60 Minutes interview that I'm sure many of you remember, and they re-aired recently, Justice Scalia talking about originalism said that sometimes people ask him, when did you become an originalist? As though, he said, as though it's some weird affliction. <laughs> like, when did you start eating human flesh? The point of all that is to say that the Federalist Society would likely not have survived at all with its mission to restore the Constitution without such a brilliant and effective advocate as Antonin Scalia simultaneously trying to restore the Constitution at the highest levels of the judiciary. I also want to talk about a word that most people don't associate with Justice Scalia, diversity. In his dissent in Obergefell, uh, the gay marriage case from last term, he wrote, take for example this court, which consists of only nine men and women, all of them successful lawyers who studied at either Harvard or Yale Law School. Four of the nine are natives of New York City. Eight of them grew up in East and West Coast states. Only one hails from the vast expanse in between. Not a single Southwesterner, or even, to tell the truth, a genuine Westerner, because California does not count. Not a single evangelical Christian, a group that comprises about one quarter of Americans, or even a Protestant of any denomination. Now, he wasn't bemoaning the not so diverse composition of the court, per se. He was making the point that such a small, unrepresentative group of people should not be in charge of making large-scale changes to policy. And whether you like the result of Obergefell or not, his point is a resonant one. His words are undergirded by the respect for diversity, some would say ironically given the context of the case, the diversity of individual viewpoints. Federalism, state federal separation of powers, local self-government, liber uh, liberty, sovereignty, these are concepts that embody respect for diversity of viewpoint, as opposed to consolidation of power over wide areas of life. It also reminds me of the diversity of views we have in the Federalist Society, the sometimes heated but always stimulating conversations we can get into in our little group. It reminds me of the fact that Scalia's opinions and votes while on the court, because of the fact that he was principled, led to what some would call a diverse set of outcomes. Outcomes like the right to burn the American flag under the First Amendment, the impermissibility of thermal imaging of a drug dealer's house as an unreasonable search under the Fourth Amendment, and very strong rights of accused criminals to confront their accusers under the Sixth Amendment. I don't want to give the wrong idea. Justice Scalia did not arrive at these outcomes because he wanted a diverse body of opinions, and certainly not because he liked the outcomes from a policy perspective. He arrived at them because of his principles and his dedication to the rule of law. This may look like a paradox to some, but it's not paradoxical for a legendary jurist in a country like the United States, where the country's founding document is supposed to mean something real, but is not intended to prescribe granular policy choices on its citizens according to the whims of the judiciary. Thank you, Justice Scalia. You're part of the soul of the Federalist Society. The Federal Society will miss you, we the people will miss you, and the rule of law will miss you. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I'm Paul Newby. I have the privilege of serving on the North Carolina Supreme Court. Uh, I want to start with uh, greetings from the Chief Justice. Unfortunately, he texted me a few minutes ago and said he had an unexpected conflict, but he certainly is here with us in spirit. Uh, also from my court, I see Justice Edmonds here with us. Uh, from the Court of Appeals, I saw Judge Calabria, and yes, um, Judge Davis is also here from the Court of Appeals. From the federal bench, I saw Judge Numbers, Judge Warren. Nice to have y'all. Uh, Dean Leonard, thank you for hosting this. Uh, you know, I've lived a pretty long time, and I can't recall another memorial service for justice. And I kind of ask myself, why? Why is that? Um, in 1776, our state constitution said a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles is absolutely necessary to preserve the blessings of liberty. And I know for me, Justice Scalia was a constant reminder to think about fundamental principles. By fundamental principles, I don't think in 2016 he would say I need to look at the 1971 Constitution or even the 1868 Constitution. Because again, that concept of looking at fundamental principles goes back to who are we as a people? Uh, what is it with this American experiment that was meant to be different and why? And I think that it, it uh, harms us when we don't do that, when we don't look at the trade-offs that we make as we think about the Constitution and what is intended by that. Interestingly, at least to me, I like North Carolina history. In 1787, uh, our predecessor court, the Court of Conference, decided the first case of judicial review. In that case, three judges who'd been appointed by the legislature to serve for good behavior, during good behavior, had to decide whether to allow the General Assembly to take away the right to a jury trial. Now, to our modern ears, we may think, well, that would have been terrible because a jury trial is so much a part of our fabric. Certainly that's true in a criminal context, but what about a civil context? You see, the, the facts in which that arose is that British citizens under North Carolina law in 1776, 1777, had lost their property. And we sold, North Carolina sold the property, think Trine's Palace, okay, because that was one of the properties, in order to pay for the revolution. Well, after the revolution, all these uh, um, grantees of different in individuals showed up in North Carolina saying, wait a second, we want our property back. Well, the legislature promptly reacted and I'm sure did the will of the people by taking away the right to a jury trial under those circumstances. They said, no, no, we will not give these people a jury trial. Now, if you were an adherent to this idea that the Constitution needs to move to, to uh, encapsulate the, the mood of the people at the time, Bayard versus Singleton would have been decided a very different way. The three judges actually adjourned for a year begging the General Assembly to change the law. Change the law. And when they came back and said, no, we're not going to change it, these three judges, recognizing that the General Assembly could strip them of their power the next day, said, words have meaning. This Constitution that we have says that people have a right to a jury trial. And that's not some current meaning that may be different than what was intended in 1776. In 1776, when we said that, we meant it. And we're going to give these folks a jury trial. I think that attitude of simply reading the document, seeing what was intended, saying what was intended is what Justice Scalia was reminding us is the true role of a judge. 
We're not policymakers. We're not a super legislature. We simply say what the law is. And when it comes to a constitution, we say what was intended when it was adopted. And frankly, I encourage you to look at the farewell address of George Washington because he counsels strongly against modifying a constitution based upon popular views at the moment as opposed to going through the amendment process that was envisioned if constitutions need to be changed. You've heard and will continue to hear about Justice Scalia being an originalist. Uh, certainly I will use his words to describe what he meant by that. He says, originalism is a manner of interpreting the Constitution that begins with the text. It gives the text the meaning that it bore when it was adopted by the people. He says, if you believe that the Constitution is not a legal text, like the text involved when a judge reconciles or decides which of two statutes prevail, if you think the Constitution is some exhortation to give effect to the most fundamental values of society, as those values may change from year to year, if you think it is simply meant to reflect the evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of a maturing society, if that's what you think it is, then why in the world would you have it interpreted by nine lawyers? What, what do I, he says, what do I know about evolving standards of decency in American society? I'd be afraid to ask. If that's what you think the Constitution is, then Marbury versus Madison is wrong. And Marbury versus Madison is the federal version of our Bayard versus Singleton. It shouldn't be up to the judges, it should be up to the legislature. We should have a system like the English. Whatever the legislature thinks is constitutional is constitutional. They know the evolving standards of society. I don't. So in principle, it's incompatible with the legal regime that America has established. Justice Scalia uh, was last here, uh, uh, at least in Raleigh, that I'm aware of, in May of last year. Uh, when he took from the incredibly busy schedule of the Supreme Court, uh, but he was going to go the next day to the graduation, I think, of one of his children at William and Mary. Uh, but he came down on a Friday night to speak to a group of about, uh, I'd say, 200 high school students from around the country who were doing a mock trial. And he emphasized his theme of originalism. Uh, and he emphasized his uh, theme that it's originalism that gives real freedom because once you constitutionalize an issue, you pretty much have taken it away from the public square and the public debate. And that, he says, he believes to be anti-democratic. Certainly, we all admire his jurisprudence. And that has had an incredible impact. But it's his ability to connect, whether it's with 200 high school kids from around the country, or whether it's with uh, the most brilliant of uh, legal practitioners, faculty members at the various prestigious law schools. Um, he was able to articulate his views. He said, what is the criterion that governs the living constitutional judge? What can you possibly use beside original meaning? Think about natural law. We all agree on natural law, right? I don't think so. You either tell your judges, look, this is a law like all laws. Give it meaning, the meaning it has when it was adopted. Or you tell your judges, govern us. You tell us whether people under 18 who committed their crimes when they were under 18 should receive a certain punishment. You tell us whether there ought to be an unlimited right to various other social issues, and I'm paraphrasing. You make these decisions for us. I have put this question. You know, I speak at law schools with some frequency just to make trouble. And I put this question to the faculty all the time or incite the students to ask their living constitutional professors. Okay, professor, 
you're not an originalist. Tell me your criterion. Scalia says he thinks that there is none other. And he says, if you don't look at a text and give meaning to the text, it leads to inflexibility on whether unelected judges should be deciding issues such as abortion and the death penalty. If you think officiados of a living constitution want to bring you flexibility, think again. You think the death penalty is a good idea? Persuade your fellow citizen to adopt it. You want a right to an abortion? Persuade your fellow citizen to enact it. That's flexibility. Why in the world would you have it interpreted by nine lawyers? Every time the Supreme Court defines another right in the Constitution, it reduces the scope of democratic debate. His view is once we have taken away the lawyering skills involved in interpreting a Constitution and ask lawyers, nine, in the U.S. Supreme Court to become philosophers, uh, to become sociologists, he says it will lead to uh, total chaos in the judicial confirmation proceedings. And frankly, even while Justice Scalia had not yet been taken from his deathbed, uh, there was uh, already this incredibly uh, divisive, raging debate. He predicted this. He was confirmed 98 to 0, probably the last one we will ever see. And he said this, today, and this was speaking 20 years after his confirmation, it's difficult to get someone confirmed to the Court of Appeals. What's happened? The American people have figured out what's going on. If we're selecting lawyers, if we are selecting people to read a text and give it the fair meaning it has when it was adopted, yes, the most important thing is to get a good lawyer. If, on the other hand, we're picking people to draw out of their own conscience and experience a new constitution with all sorts of new values to govern our society, then we should not look principally for good lawyers. We should look principally for people who agree with us, the majority, as to whether there ought to be this right or that right or the other right. We want to pick people who would write the new constitution that we want. If that's why you, and that's why you hear in the discourse on this subject, people talking about moderate. We want moderate judges. What's a moderate interpretation of the text? Halfway between what it really means and what you want it to mean? There's no such thing as a moderate interpretation of the text. Would you ask a lawyer, draw me a moderate contract? The only way the word has meaning is if you're looking for someone to write a law, to write a constitution rather than interpret one. The moderate judge is the one who will devise the new constitution that most people would approve of. So for example, we had a uh, suicide case some terms ago and the court refused to hold there was a constitutional right to assisted suicide. He goes on to say we're not there yet, uh, but as time may come, uh, we may be ready for that as well. I have to say personally, in addition to certainly professionally and intellectually being challenged by Justice Scalia, uh, I'm so, uh, I so admire the man. Uh, he said this, he said in his various jurisprudential debates, I, det I attack ideas and he could write a pretty firm dissent, he said I attack ideas, I don't attack people. Some very good people have some very bad ideas. And you can't, if you can't separate the two, you gotta get another job. And certainly he lived out that principle as he took uh, Justice uh, Kagan uh, hunting with him and he and Justice Ginsburg had their famous friendship. Most importantly, just as Judge uh, Dean Leonard uh, referred at the very beginning of this program, uh, Justice Scalia stood on his principles. Now, uh, he was well known uh, for his Catholic faith, and he was fond of saying there's no such thing as a Catholic judge, just as there's no such thing as a Catholic way to cook a hamburger. Uh, I'll defer to those who know better than I if that's true. Um, he said that there were two scriptures that really directed him personally 
And he said, uh, you know, he said that that would certainly have impacted his judicial work. The first scripture was, be thou perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, as Jesus extolled us to be. And he also said, uh, the other principal scripture was, thou shalt not lie. Um, Justice Scalia unashamedly accepted the principal doctrines of the Christian faith. I know I'm encouraged when I walk into Campbell Law School, I see Micah 6.8, what does the Lord require of you? Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Justice Scalia believed in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. He believed that Jesus Christ was the divine Son of God who died for our sins, was buried and rose again on the third day. And he knew as he talked to people, journalists from New York and Washington, the elite, uh, he knew that they couldn't believe that someone of his intellect would believe in those basic tenets of Christian faith. He said this to a group of lawyers that were gathered, Christian lawyers, God assumed from the beginning that the wise of the world would view Christians as fools, and he has not been disappointed. If I brought you any message today, it's this, have the courage to have your wisdom regarded as stupidity. Be fools for Christ and have the courage to suffer the contempt of the sophisticated world. I hope and pray that my life will embody the principles uh, that Justice Scalia boldly uh, was willing to live for. And I love the way that he uh, responded when asked about his legacy. I don't worry about my legacy. Just do your job right, and then who cares? Good afternoon. I am uh, Greg Wallace. I teach constitutional law here at Campbell Law School. And Philip, thank you for the invitation to speak at uh, the memorial service of one of my intellectual heroes. I was uh, heartbroken last week when I heard that Justice Scalia had died. And he uh, he was a tremendous figure, uh, especially for those of us who teach constitutional law. With his brilliance and his wit, he single-handedly transformed the debate about the Constitution and the rule of law. He helped move the Supreme Court from a somewhat sloppy, results-oriented, center-left institution to a more intellectually rigorous center-right court that emphasizes text and history over other modes of constitutional interpretation. For most, he was the intellectual face of originalism. I think his most significant contribution was his powerful defense and use of originalism in constitutional interpretation. When he was first appointed to the court, most justices and legal scholars tended to ignore the original meaning of the Constitution and instead treat it as a, a living document, uh, uh, the meaning of which changes over time to fit current cultural values and political concerns. Well, Justice Scalia made originalism intellectually respectable and for many intellectually acceptable. He reminded, he admonished, and sometimes he even scolded his colleagues and the entire legal community that modern law is all about legal text, the text of statutes, the text of regulations, and of course the text of the Constitution itself. In his view, the role of judges was to interpret constitutional text according to its ordinary meaning, just like they interpret other legal texts, contracts, property deeds, wills. They're to be read, the Constitution was to be read 
in the context of the document as a whole, as well as history and tradition. I think perhaps the greatest sign of his influence as the champion of originalism and textualism is that liberal justices and scholars now make arguments based on constitutional text and history. The pinnacle, I think, of Justice Scalia's originalism was the Heller decision involving the meaning of the Second Amendment. In that case, which is a wonderful case to read if you haven't ever read it, uh, Justice Scalia uh, went uh, to bat against Justice Stevens, who wrote the main dissenting opinion over whether the Second Amendment protects an individual right to keep and bear arms for the purpose of self-defense. And guess what kind of arguments Justice Stevens made? Originalist arguments. Justice Stevens, who certainly was no originalist on the court, uh, yet in the time uh, in, in debating one of the most important debates over uh, the, uh, the, the meaning of the Second Amendment uh, uh, to the Constitution, uh, resorted to originalism to try to make his case. And I think that's one great example of Justice Scalia's influence on the court uh, as a champion of originalism. Now, I was asked today to talk about Justice Scalia's influence on academia. Uh, I have the great privilege of teaching first-year students constitutional law. Now, most of you in here are lawyers, so you can kind of remember what your first exposure to constitutional law was like. Fortunately, at our law school, we hold that off to the second semester because it's such a shock for our first-year students to move from cases reading contract law, property law, tort law, and getting into the deep end of the pool with constitutional law. Uh, so my students, uh, as first years, get initially exposed to Justice Scalia in the Mistretta opinion. I don't know if you recall that one or not. It was when the Justice Scalia cast the only dissenting vote and argued that Congress does not have the power to delegate lawmaking authority to the United States Sentencing Commission to make rules uh, in the form of sentencing guidelines. Only dissenter, only justice in, I, in my view that took a principal stand for the separation of powers. Now he repeated that position with a few additional uh, justices joining him in the Morrison case, which is a case that my first year students are going to read uh, for next class. And there, another separation of powers classic, Justice Scalia writes the dissenting opinion and argues that the Independent Counsel Act deprives the president of the exclusively executive power of criminal prosecution. When my first year students read Justice Scalia, they have an interesting reaction. When, after I heard that Justice Scalia had died, and the very next class with my 1L students, I showed them a video that was made by some Harvard Law students uh, for a, some sort of dramatic competition, and it depicted a first year Harvard Law student, very progressive, very committed to all of the things her uh, liberal Harvard Law School professors would be happy with, going into her first year and starting to read cases. And all of a sudden she realized that as she's reading and briefing cases, there's one opinion writer that she loves to read. You can guess who it is, Justice Scalia because his opinions are straightforward, they're logical, they're understandable, and they're sometimes even a little snarky, okay, which students like to have. And so they depict, uh, this video depicts her, you know, when she's getting sleepy at night and reading her assignments, she's looking up an opinion of Scalia to read. And, and, uh, and she uh, uh, wants to hide her, her affinity for Scalia, but just can't help herself, and many of her student colleagues are horrified at it. Uh, 
but finally she comes to the end and finds a group of, of uh, similarly situated students, one of whom tears open his shirt and has a picture of Justice Scalia as uh, the gangsta originalist here. <laughs> well, uh, my students are just like the student in that video. They tend to be drawn to Justice Scalia's opinion for that, uh, for the very reasons that, uh, that that student was in the video. One thing about Justice Scalia's opinions is that they were also funny. Uh, he had a way of, of incorporating humor to make his point. My favorite one on this count is the PGA Tour versus Martin case. PGA golfer Casey Martin had su suffered from a disorder making it difficult for him to walk on the golf course. He asked the PGA if he could use a golf cart and the PGA said no, that's not what golf is all about, okay? So he filed a claim under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the case went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court was asked to decide whether allowing a disabled contestant to ride around in a golf court would fundamentally alter the nature of a PGA golf tournament. Well, the majority said no, seven to two, and ruled in favor of Mr. Martin. Justice Scalia dissented. And this is what he said. It has been rendered the solemn duty of the Supreme Court of the United States laid upon it by Congress in pursuance of the federal government's power to regulate commerce to decide what is golf. <laughs> I am sure that the framers of the Constitution aware of the 1457 edict of King James II of Scotland prohibiting golf because it interfered with the practice of archery fully expected that sooner or later the paths of golf and government, the law and the links, would once again cross, and that the judges of this august court would someday have to wrestle with that age-old jurisprudential question for which their years of study in the law have so well prepared them. Is someone riding around a golf course from shot to shot, really a golfer? The answer we learn is yes. The court ultimately concludes, and it will henceforth be the law of the land, that walking is not a fundamental aspect of golf. Either out of humility or out of self-respect, one or the other, the court should decline to answer this incredibly difficult and incredibly silly question. To say that something is essential is ordinarily to say that it is necessary to the achievement of a certain object. But since it is the very nature of a game to have no object except amusement, that is what distinguishes games from productive activity, it is quite impossible to say that any of a game's arbitrary rules is essential. That was Justice Scalia. And he, his writing, his arguments, his demeanor, uh, especially for first year students, I have found teaching constitutional law for more than 20 years, is something that has made originalism intellectually attractive to those students steeped in the living constitutionalism of their undergraduate studies. I've seen many Scalia converts over the years. Uh, sometimes they have been open about it and told me, other times, you know, I've learned only by happenstance. But Scalia's uh, use of originalism and the wonderful way he presented it in original form was very persuasive, both to law students and law professors. And speaking of law professors, Justice Scalia had some vice for us as well. This is what he said. What endures is the human spirit. And if I have any legacy, anything that really endures, it is the preserving and passing on of that spirit. 
I say the much the same thing to law faculties when I have occasion to speak to them at faculty lunches. They are obsessed with publishing. They think this is going to be their mark on the law, their legacy. I tell them how foolish that is. The shelf life of the Great American Law Review article is about five years, and of the Great American Treatise, maybe 25. After that, they're just of historical interest. What endures, Justice Scalia said, is what happens in the classroom. I still have people come up to me who are my students at the University of Virginia in the 1970s, for Pete's sake, who are full of gratitude and say, you know, I was in your contracts class and you lit a spark in me for the love of the law and I never lost it. Some of those people have passed it on to others. So I tell law professors, that's where you make your mark. That's where your legacy will be in passing on your spirit of the law to others who will pass it on once again. His example, uh, of course, and a legacy to all of us, as I told my law students the other day, was his ability to get along with and make close and fast friendships with those with whom he disagreed. No better example with uh, is his friendship with Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, his intellectual opposite on the court. Uh, Justice Ginsburg says Scalia was her best friend on the court. They would often attend opera together and there's a wonderful picture of them on the internet riding an elephant together in India, if you can imagine that. Look it up. But Justice Scalia taught us by his example those of us who are law professors, those of us who are students, and even those of us who are lawyers and judges, that one of the great things, one of the great character qualities of our life should be our ability to get along with people who disagree with us. In that way, we keep our minds and our hearts sharp. We don't grow up in being insular and thinking in a vacuum. We're able to interact with people that differ from us but people with whom we can enjoy friendships. We will miss you, Justice Scalia. You have left your mark on us in so many ways. A personal moment and then an introduction. Uh, the enigma of Justice Scalia was that in many areas his views were very predictable but in others they were not predictable at all and although I never knew the justice personally I was the beneficiary of his independent thinking when Congress did a massive rewrite of the bankruptcy code in 2005 the most controversial provision was the inclusion of a means test to determine who was eligible the language was somewhat garbled and I took the view, in contrast to many of my colleagues who had already written, that although garbled, the language was plain and should be given its full meaning as written, even though I would admit that the results were sometimes close to nonsensical. Surprisingly, the Ninth Circuit liked my opinion and adopted it. But other circuits tried to fix the statute, and the issue went to the Supreme Court where, sadly to me, it lost there eight to one. But the lone dissenter was Justice Scalia, who saw the issue exactly as I had. And to this day, I argue that the unusual alliance of Justice Scalia, the Ninth Circuit, and me were exactly right. And although I did not know the justice personally, others from North Carolina did. One of his closest friends was Judge Malcolm Howard, the United States District Judge in Greenville. And because of that friendship, he came here regularly. He came here to speak. He came here to visit. He came here to hunt. And in each instance, my good friend, Johnny Dove, who was the senior deputy United States Marshal in that part of North Carolina, 
routinely provided the justice with security, with companionship, and with transportation. I've invited uh, Marshall Dove here uh, to share for a few minutes a couple of remembrances he might have. Johnny? Thank you, Judge Leonard. My name is Johnny Dove. I'm a retired Deputy U.S. Marshal here in the Eastern District of North Carolina. Now, uh, my story is about Justice Scalia are different from most because most stories deal with the law. I met Justice Scalia in a happy environment. We, 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 had, we, had, we had fun. And as you know, he was an avid hunter and fisherman. Uh, a couple of occasions I had to uh, meet with him. Uh, one particular occasion, uh, Judge Howard called me one night and asked me, he said, Marshal Dove, I got a uh, situation I want to run by you, and if you agree with it, I'll call the marshal and see if we can't work it out. He said, my good friend Justice Scalia is coming for a fishing and hunting trip. He said, we're going to be up in the mountains in Asheville at my cabin. He knew I was an avid hunter. I love to hunt. He said, I know you like to hunt, so I just want to know if you will want to go on the trip. If you do, I'll talk to the marshal. So I agreed to do it. And uh, after I agreed to it, I got to thinking. I said, now, how much hunting going to be going on? I'm supposed to be working. So I'm going to catch 22. I'm supposed to be hunting. I'm supposed to be working, and he's going to be hunting. So I called just out back, and I asked him, I said, now, how much work and how much hunting we going to be doing? He said, don't worry about it. You're going to be hunting just like everybody else. I said, OK. So we, I went on the trip, I got my vehicle gassed up, and I met them in the mountains. Well, when I got there, I met Jessica Lear, shook his hand, and I was quite amazed because, really, he wasn't much taller than I was. I, most times when you see him on TV, he's sitting down. Although you see him standing up, I was amazed that he wasn't much taller than me, if at all. But he had an easy spirit about him, an easy spirit. And you could tell he was very, very, very intelligent. He and Judge Howard would sit down at the dinner table, and I can't tell you how many times the word constitution and, and legal terms would come up, and they were back and <laughs> forth, back and forth. So we went on our trip the next day. We went fishing in one of the uh, streams in, Ashbur in uh, Asheville, <laughs> fly, fly fishing. And so we out fishing. We got the guy, got us out, and put us out on our little stands, and he put Judge Howard and Judge Scalia around the bend for me, and I'm thinking, you know, you're really supposed to be working, so you might not need to be around the being. You might be around the being with them. So I moved around, me and Judge Daniels were with us. I moved around and got closer to where I could see them. And we fished and we fished and we were, they were catching trout. I'm a country boy. So I'm thinking French fries, coleslaw, and iced tea. <laughs> so Judge Howard, Judge Scalia put up a nice trout, take him off the hook, and throw him back in the stream. <laughs> I looked at Judge Daniel. I said, uh, Judge Daniel, we know we don't we know eating fish tonight. He said, I think this is catch and release. <laughs> I said, okay, catch and release. And we caught, I bet we caught 20 trout, nice trout, and threw them all back. <laughs> we got there that night, got to the cabin that night. Me and Judge Daniel, we roomed in the same cabin. And you know the old story about John Boy. Good night, John Boy. <laughs> Judge Daniel said, sure would have been nice to have some trout, french fries, and coleslaw, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Judge Scalia was the type of guy that you could really talk to. He, had, he, he was very funny in his own way. He was very funny. I mean, he would shoot a line at you right quick, and you just had to think about it for a minute. Did he really say that? <laughs> I mean, he, he was a real nice guy, very in intelligent and very funny. Second occasion I met him, he came to Greenville to speak at ECU. After the uh, speaking engagement, I was supposed to take him to Corolla, North Carolina. I don't know if you know where Corolla is, but I was in Greenville, and we had to go to Corolla. I call it the jumping off point. <laughs> when you pass Corolla, all water. I mean, we were at the edge of the earth. <laughs> we got in the car, gassed up, got in the car. 
and we headed to Corolla. He talked me to death. <laughs> he talked about my sons. He talked about everything that you could think of. You would never, you would think he knew me all my life, the way we were talking. But he always gave advice. He talked about my son's education. And, and first one thing to know, he's just a personal type guy. We got so personal after, after the uh, event was over, I had some deputies call me numerous times. This, this was in 93, the last trip was in 204. I retired in 212. In 210, 2010, guys would call me and say, man, I met a friend of yours today. I said, who was it? Jessica Lea. I said, really? He said, yeah, we were out in Texas on a hunting trip. And he said, you know Johnny Dove? <laughs> Every deputy he met, he asked, do you know Johnny Dove? That's what type of person he was. He was a super, super guy. The Scalia family has really lost a patriot. The Supreme Court has lost one of his greatest justices. And the world has lost a great human being. And my religious background tells me that to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. May his soul rest in peace. So that's all our speakers for today. I want to thank all of y'all for coming, and thank you to all the great speakers. Y'all all did a great job. Um, and I want to introduce uh, Monsignor Brockman. He's going to do the benediction. And then if y'all will join us in the Grand Pope foyer afterwards, we're going to have some light refreshments. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much, Dean, and uh, your honors. Let us pray. Almighty Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity this afternoon to honor the life and contributions of your servant, Justice Antonin Scalia. As through your son, you have made known to us that in your house there are many dwelling places. Receive the soul of your servant, Justice Scalia, into the joy of your kingdom, and life in your presence forever. Be with his wife and children, many friends and colleagues as they mourn his death and seek the healing that only you can provide. Mindful of the great legacy you made possible in and through Justice Scalia, guide us all to pursue what is good and right for those we serve. Make us trustworthy with confidence, confidence is given. Make us wise in study, able in our deliberations, courageous for those whom we defend, ever courteous with those we face, and attentive to the sanctuary of our conscience, always informed by your truth. For we ask this as we pray, through Christ our Lord. Amen.